All right. I think our numbers have topped out. They're close to 60. We're time to begin. So I'm going to go back so I can just see one person right now. Uh, I'm going to try something new. The Bergs are doing all of the videos for us this morning. So the welcome, benediction, reading. So Karen and Chris, Good take morning, it away. Good morning, Holy Trinity. Uh, welcome to church from the Berg family. Um, so we have been, gosh, home in this house for a long time, just like everybody. Um, uh, this summer we've been doing a lot of hiking and bike riding, um, trying to get together physically distanced uh, with friends when we can. Uh, bunch of trips to York Beach. Uh, we like to go to Long Sands, uh, especially at low tide. Um, what else, hon? Um, we went to Calumet uh, a couple of weeks ago. Had a great time there. And heading out on the beach, doing a little bike riding, uh, and just enjoying uh, the atmosphere there at that great place. Um, other than that, just trying to stay active and stay sane and <laughs> <laughs> yeah the kids have been doing some uh, remote scout camp uh, activities this week so that's been really cool eric's been basket weaving and noah's been playing chess uh, and they've both been kind of participating in this electronics uh, so they have like a little workshop set up in the garage um, that's been really really cool for them um, you know, it's hard without them being able to be getting together with their friends, but we're uh, doing the best we can and, you know, getting through. You got it. So, uh, hope you're all doing great and have a good service. Yep. Thank you, Bergs. We continue with our gathering hymn, Amazing Grace. Together, let us say, most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, 
and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Receive God's forgiveness. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Our gospel reading today comes from Matthew, the 13th chapter, and we hear from uh, Eric Berg. This reading is from Matthew 13, verses 31 to 52. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and showered his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it, it has grown in the greatest of shrubs, it becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into it, into baskets, and threw the, out the bad. So that at the end of the age, the angels would come and separate the evil from the righteous, and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all of this? They answered, Yes. And then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe ha who has been tamed out in the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord, the Word of God for the people of God. All right. I love this quote. I think I've used it before. It's by Dallas Willard. The gospel is less about how to get into the kingdom of heaven after you die and more about how you live in the kingdom of heaven before you die. Right? We often think, or I think a misconception of the faith is how to get somewhere else when you die. And while that is a part of it, um, that is not the essence of it. The essence is of how we live now, and I think that's what these parables are about, changing us to live now differently. So we are going to continue, and we're going to start off with a clip from Empire Strikes Back. That is Luke Skywalker, in which he is having a conversation with Darth Vader, and he just found out that Darth Vader is his father. So let us watch this clip about 25 seconds. No. It's not true. That's impossible. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. So, let us continue to see. You're not going to watch it again. To see what Empire Strikes Back might have to do with this gospel lesson. Hey everybody from Holy Trinity, it's Pastor Tim once again back in the sanctuary. And you should have just seen a clip from uh, a great movie, Empire Strikes Back. Uh, the second of the Star Wars movies that was made, although it's number five in the trilogy. 
Uh, Empire Strikes Back. And the clip that you saw was Luke and Darth Vader. Luke, after he had his hand cut off in the lightsaber fight with Darth Vader, he's now backed out onto this plank, holding on to this whatever it is in the middle of this huge uh, hole, I guess you could say, this big tube in the middle of the space station. Um, and Darth Vader had just told him, Luke, I'm your father. And so we heard the reaction of, no, that's impossible. And then he lets go and he flails. So I'm going to come back to why I showed you that clip in just a minute. But I want to talk about these parables uh, first, or get into talking about the parables. Because in the scripture reading we had for today, we had five parables. Parable of the mustard seed, uh, parable of the yeast or the leaven, parable of the hidden treasure, parable of the fine pearl, and parable of the net being tossed out into the sea. Now, frequently in when these parables are preached, and I've done it before also, I'm not saying it's wrong, uh, but I think it misses the full scope. Frequently, when we preach on these parables or we read these parables, we come to see them almost as moral lessons. What I mean by that, and I'll just use um, these first two as an example, the parable and the yeast. Uh, the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast. The mustard seed, it's this tiny little seed that grows up to do big things, right? You can almost remember the Veggie Tale songs, little guys can do big things too. I'm big, he's little, right? And he's referring to King David slaying the, Goliath, uh, the giant Goliath. And we take this mustard seed to think along those same lines. It's don't give up, even though you're, you're tiny, you don't have much, you can do great things. And there is some truth to that, so I don't want to diminish it. And we do the same thing with the parable of the yeast. A little bit of yeast infects the entire dough or in the entire flour. No place is not affected by when you mix in the yeast and you mix it all up, right? It takes this flour that normally wouldn't have done anything by itself and this reaction between the two and now when you make bread, this bread rises. And so as Christians were called out to, uh, if you want to use the word infect the world, so everything is touched by us and nothing is left the same and things grow because of our action in the world. And again, there's some truth to it, but I think that is kind of moralizing these parables and it doesn't give the full meaning or the full effect by what I think they're all really trying to do as opposed to moralize our faith. These parables are helping us to transform the way we see our faith that it's not just about me doing a specific action when I leave, but rather it is about the overall view I have about the way in which the world works currently, the way in which we wish it would continue to work, and the way in which God's kingdom comes in and is working to transform it, to help it function in an entirely different way. And it's helping us to see, you might say, the upside downness of God's kingdom. You're almost like when we've had that pyramid before. I'm going to go back to this again the pyramid of the food pyramid. Humans were atop, uh, uh, right? Like we ruled everything. And what has God come along? And He turns that upside down. And we are not consumers, but we're supposed to be producers. And so that changing of that pyramid from top to bottom helps us see, transform, and see who we are in reality, in God's reality. And these parables go to function the same way, to help us see how we should be functioning in these big general ways. That as Luke is, when Luke hears the truth, in that clip from Empire Strikes Back, no, that's impossible. I think frequently we react the same way if we really hear what they are trying to tell us. And again, we lose so much because this was written down almost 2,000 years ago. And so we need a bit more of the context, here's that word again, if we want to get the full impact of what these parables are going to have on us. And they should, at some level, make us scream, no, that's impossible. That's not what I want it to be. 
help me cling to this other way of life that I want to have. And our faith should be more like that. That's why I love that quote that was just on uh, beforehand on that image before as we're worshiping from Dallas Willard. The kingdom of God is more about is not about life after you die, but more about life before you die. And these parables are getting, trying to get us to realize the radicalness, the radical nature, even the scandalous nature of what the kingdom of heaven is really like, not later on that we hope to go to if we make the right decisions when we die, rather what the kingdom of heaven looks like right now among us. So let's start off with that first parable, the parable of the mustard seed. Not so much about uh, little guys can do big things too, but rather the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is found in what you're trying to potentially maybe get rid of. It's not found in the biggest, in the mightiest, in the strongest, the redwood, right, the redwood kind of tree that would have been around back then, the strong cedars. But instead, it's found in a seed that you might plant, as opposed to mustard being a weed at that time that you're trying to pull up after it's grown. Can you imagine the people hearing this for the first time, and they hear the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, not just a mustard plant, a mustard seed. So you almost have to plant it. They'd be thinking, why would you want to plant this thing? You want to get rid of it. You are ridiculous by even starting to compare the kingdom of heaven as like a mustard seed. I was reading a, um, uh, a, a book, right? I, I forget what kind of book it was. Um, but anyways, it's talking about, uh, can you imagine the kingdom of heaven is like crabgrass? Or the kingdom of heaven is like a dandelion? We wouldn't want that. We want the kingdom of heaven is like a beautiful individual rose. A kingdom of heaven is like uh, a lavender bush with its beautiful, sweet aroma that filters through the air. But God doesn't use those, Jesus isn't using those kind of analogies to write this parable. He's getting people to think differently. Think about God's kingdom in ways in which you had dismissed it before. You've made judgments on what God's kingdom looks like. And Jesus is coming to say, get rid of those judgments and look again. And if we are honest with ourselves, we have done the same thing. We think God's kingdom looks like and we oftentimes associate that with power, with wealth, right? This is what it means to live the good life. And yet, God comes among us and says, God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is like something you would have dismissed. This mustard seed that you think has little value and yet provides the basic resources for things around us. The mustard seed grows. And it's not that it grows and turns into a cedar. It's not that it becomes the big and the mighty. It remains what it is. And yet, what it is, is what is needed to provide homes for the birds and nests, for the animals, to find shelter within it. It doesn't have to become the big and mighty. It just needs to be what it is and see that there is value in it. Have we dismissed things in this world because they are not what we imagine it should be and we, so we say it has no value? Instead, how is our line of thinking changing to see God working in new ways. Parable of the mustard seed. This is an interesting one coming up now, the parable of the yeast. Traditionally it is, right? Uh, the yeast is added to the flour, it's kneaded in, it spreads, and the whole thing is infected by it, right? So again, how as Christians, how are we spreading and infecting the world with Christianity, with God, with Jesus? What's interesting is I was just reading about this too, commentary. The commentary I was reading, it's a kind of book, I knew it would come back to me eventually. The commentary was saying yeast, 
was used to describe corruption. It, what, in when it was used in an analogy, it wasn't used as a good thing. It was used to, to describe corruption. So here we have a parable. Can you imagine the people hearing this parable? The kingdom of heaven is like a woman who adds corruption, a little bit of corruption to this flower, to what is going to be needed. This little bit. And it's not that she needs it in, right? Doesn't that she works the dough, but it's hidden. In the King James Version, in the Revised Standard Version, they use the word to hide or hidden as opposed to needing it or mixing it in. It's kind of secretive without it. It's not this big, grand, glorious thing that functions, but instead, as Christians, maybe we need to learn to be a bit more subtle Go about, our do, go about doing our work and trusting it will spread. Right? Not just, hey, look at me, look at me. You know, Jesus actually calls that out earlier on in Matthew's gospel. Don't be like the hypocrites who stand out on the corner saying their prayers, ripping their clothes and saying, oh, you know, uh, I'm fasting. So they disfigure their faces. Rather, do the work we're called to do. And trust it will spread, that it will be contagious, right? A different way of thinking about things. It's changing the way we view our role as Christians in the world. And then we have the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the fine pearls. They're doing ridiculous things that they shouldn't be doing. Can you imagine going and selling everything you have to buy this field, to have this treasure, selling everything that you have, all your home, your possessions, whatever it might be, to buy this pearl. Because once you have this pearl, once you have this treasure, what now? What do you do for food? What do you do for your home? What do you do for providing if you have a family or if you have servants at that time? What do you do? You've just given it all away, not given it all, we've just traded it all for this one thing and now the responsibilities that you have you can't do because you have this one thing so if you want to fulfill those responsibilities what do you have to do with this i have to sell it to be able to do those things again it just doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense both of these parables the person is doing something that they shouldn't be doing that they so enraptured with this object that they're willing to do the ridiculousness that people are looking down upon to pursue something. Are we able to do the ridiculous because we are so enraptured by the love of God revealed to us in Christ? Are we willing to do what the rest of the world says? You're crazy. You shouldn't be doing that. That doesn't make sense. That's not the way the world works. Are we able to see things differently, to be transformed? Because again, this last one, this last parable, the fish in the net, it's very similar to last week, the parable of the weeds and the wheat. Just cast out your net. Who are you to judge? Right? The, the people cast out their net, they bring in their fish, and then other people are the ones that sort it. That's not our job is to sort the good from the bad. We'll probably get that wrong when we say, hey, this fish is good, this fish is bad. That's not our job. We have one job. Cast the net. God will do the sorting. We don't do that. And some of these things are so much against our nature. All of it. We want to judge we want to accumulate. We want to, to be the strong and the mighty, the cedar tree. I don't want to be the mustard seed or the dandelion or the crabgrass. The world doesn't see value in it. But yet, God's kingdom, right? Theology of glory versus theology of cross. We've talked about things. Theology of glory calls an evil thing good and a good thing evil. Theology of cross calls a thing what it is. 
Let's be what we were made to be, which is going to be so different. In fact, Matthew's gospel is so littered with all of these things that are different than what they originally, uh, than the way people originally wanted things to work. Gospel of Matthew is continually telling people God functions differently. And I think these parables are a way to drive that, those points home that God functions differently. Remember, blessed are the poor, or poor in spirit. And we can use a different word for blessed. I like saying God is close to. God is close to those who are poor and poor in spirit. God is close to those who mourn. God is close to those who hunger and thirst. As opposed to, they must be living right, because look at all the good things they got. We've all heard that phrase or said that phrase. I must be doing something right because everything's working out. Somebody up there likes me. God's world functions differently. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. Remember, Jesus talks to the rich young ruler. I've done all these things. Sells what you have and give it to the poor. God is continually changing our view of the world and said God works differently. Love those, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. These are things that we are called to do. These parables are helping us to see God functions differently because I need to see that because I don't want to love my enemies or pray for those people who persecute me. They're my enemies for a reason. I don't love them. <laughs> and God calls us to view things differently. That's what these parables do. To, to transform the way we think. And that's really hard. I don't want to transform the way I think. I want to keep it the same. I want to take in things that reinforce my opinion so I can feel better about myself to say that I've already got it right. And again, people of faith, we should be able to name that, push it aside and say, God, Help me learn what I need to learn. And that most important thing is that we need to learn is God loves you unconditionally. So it's okay if you thought one thing before and now you're learning to think something else and you're changing your mind. That's not called being wrong. That's called growth. Right? That's not called losing faith. That's called being better. As Christians, that's our goal, not to, to have it right, but to try and try again to get it right, which means we recognize that we didn't have it right before. These parables are helping us to see the way we viewed things, the way things were viewed then, the way we view things now, are not the way God wants us to view things. God comes and turns our world upside down. Who you are is not, your worth is not based on your accomplishments according to God. So you can stop trying so hard to impress people. You can stop trying so hard to impress yourself when you look in the mirror. You can simply look in the mirror and say, God loves me. You can simply look at somebody and say, God loves them. And then we can look at the world together and say, let's try to love. Amen. We continue our service with the offering. Um, if you hadn't heard, we accomplished our goal for the social ministry fund. So thank you everybody for doing that as we've increased our social ministry budget this year by 51%. Uh, so that is fantastic. Many ways to support the church uh, and our ministries. Mail off, mail your check or drop it off at church, the Alexio app, our website, and text to give. And we're fortunate enough, Karen Bird is going to share her faith story with us. Hello everyone. What does my faith mean to me? Well, I grew up going to church. I went to a Lutheran church down in New Jersey. 
Um, it was King of Kings Lutheran Church, and it was a big church. Uh, we were always up on Sunday mornings early to, to get over there, the whole family, and um, they had, I was always in the choir, and there was youth group, and plays, and then live nativity, and it was just a big part of our life. Um, so for a very long time, um, again, I just didn't know, I didn't know any different, and it, and it was just really a special place to grow up. But there was a time, you know, when I was probably late high school, um, beginning of college, when it wasn't a priority. You know, I was, I was kind of far from my faith and um, kind of making my own, you know, teenage self-centered choices. Um, but God continued to put people into my life and to bring me back, to bring me back to my faith. And, and I truly believe these individuals were gifts from God um, to help me get back to my faith and who I truly am. Um, a college roommate that I had, um, she was a basketball player with me. Um, Chris, who I met, who when I met in college, and he also, was also a Lutheran. Um, my cooperating teacher when I was doing my student teaching. Um, a, a colleague, a coworker when I first moved to New Hampshire. Um, all of these people uh, helped to bring me back to church and bring me back to my faith. And I really believe that, you know, God was not going to let me go. Um, my hope is to someday and, you know, to continue to be that individual for someone I meet um, or for our children and or for our children to fill that role, you know, by us providing them with this connection to the church. Um, I also feel like my mind and my body tend to be very busy. Um, I feel like church is a place where I can find connection and I'm comfortable. Um, I, I find it to be a place where I can reset um, and I feel centered and grounded, um, a place where I can find peace. Um, and I feel like all of those things, you know, also help me to be a better educator and a better mom and a better wife. And uh, I hopefully help me to put out joy into the world. Thank you, Karen. We continue our service with the passing of the peace. Mark, I'm going to stop the screen sharing. Uh, as you know, when you get an option to join, you're more than welcome to. Do not feel forced to, but take three minutes. And how have you found peace in your life this past week? A lot of people coming back. So as they do, we continue our service with prayers of the people. So what we ask you to do is we're going to watch this video for our prayers. It is the Serenity Prayer written by Ryan Holden Niebuhr with music by Timothy Coons. And as you watch, you're able to type in and share your prayers with everybody. And at the end, I will pray for us. So please go ahead and share those prayers using the chat feature as we watch and listen to the Serenity Prayer.
Together, let us pray. Lord, we lift up all these prayers that were just typed in, the prayers that were said silent in our hearts, that were not shared, and the prayers that we don't even know we need, but we feel deep within us. Whether we are grieving the loss of loved ones, whether we are celebrating birthdays, whether it's any of those moments or emotions found in between, we trust that you are present with us, and we ask you to lead us throughout our life, knowing that you are not far and distant, but close beside us. In your name we pray. Amen. If you have your communion elements ready, I will try and be a little bit more um, obvious on when to um, take the elements. And then after we do receive communion, there's another short brief video to watch also. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, gave it a wall to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in the remembrance of me. Trusting in these promises, let us pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us, led by Chris and Noah Berg. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So at this time, if you have a piece of bread with you, as I say the words, you may eat it, the body of Christ given for you. And if you have your wine or juice, the blood of Christ shed for you. And let us watch this about Holy Communion. Gracious Father, we give you praise and thanks for this holy communion, the body and blood of your beloved Son, the body is broken, God's love poured open to make us new Lord make us new Abba Father we bless your name and 
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. And all God's people said, Amen. Some announcements to go through before we sing our, uh, or we see, sing if you want to, our sending song. Weekday outdoor gatherings, they've been going really well. We are reaching our limit, it looks like. So if that continues to happen, where we have people requesting that they want to come, but cannot sign up, we will add more. Tuesday, 7 to 7.30. Wednesday morning, 11 to 11.30. I guess I should say the Tuesday one is, is just about filled up. There is room on Wednesday morning. Uh, and if the heat is as hot as it says on Wednesday, uh, maybe we'll do that on Zoom since we can't be inside an air conditioning and mid to high 90s does not sound exactly pre pleasant uh, to be outside. So be looking for updated information on that. Sign-ups and safety protocols have been in the tidings and on hdlc.com. So please thank you for everybody who has been participating in that. And Mark, put those links in the chat option right now on um, the sign of genius on the, so you can do that. Papa Pantry uh, took a step forward this week. Uh, Christina Dolcino and Paulette have been working on that as opposed to having those bins that you see in that first picture where people have to open them up and take food out. They simply put out bags of groceries and they even had a cooler of, fruit, of fresh fruits and vegetables. And uh, it was well received by the community. Much more food was taken and I believe almost all those fresh fruits and vegetables. So uh, if you'd like to donate, please drop it off at church. And um, as they find a good rhythm to setting it up, they'll be asking for more help on setting it up and taking it down as well. So thank you, Paulette and Christina for doing that. Uh, Jill Shook and uh, Bonnie Sanders said this earlier, this uh, <coughs> Dover Friendly Kitchen is happening this week. They're looking for about six folks to help out. Uh, so please um, contact them if you need. And Crystal says to everybody, Sydney Small turned nine on July 15th. Oh, Sydney or Crystal, we're not there at birthdays yet. Be patient. We'll get there soon. Um, so John Box says screensaver. I don't know if you're seeing my screensaver. Is that what you're trying to say, if someone could help me out. Hopefully you see- no, right. please ignore. Oh, please ignore. All right, Jonathan, thank you. Uh, we have a uh, announcement from Faith Big regarding Luther Crest's uh, Bold Transformational Faith Program. And Jerry's retiring after 40 years at the Navy shipyard. Congratulations, uh, Jerry. But we'll get to those celebrations in a minute. Let's listen to Faith about uh, bold transformational faith. Good morning, Holy Trinity family. How are you? This is Faith Big, your faith formation coordinator. I wanted to just take a brief moment to talk to you about something very exciting we have going on currently. It is the Kids Day Camp. And the days for the D Kids Day Camp is going to be August 3rd through 6th or August 10th through 13th. The program will be completely the same on those dates, so you can pick whichever week works best for you and your family. The Kids Day Camp is being offered by Luther Crest Ministries out of Minnesota, and we're extremely excited that we are partnering with them to bring this experience to you and to your families. The program itself will consist of different parts. There'll be a video each morning, and there will be activities and games to get the kids outside and get them fully fully engaged in the lesson for the day. There will also be songs and there will be a Bible dive at night. So each night there'll be a Zoom meeting where they will be able to have an interactive experience with other campers and it will help solidify the lesson for that day. All materials are provided for free from Holy Trinity and I will be putting together camp kits this week and those will be available by the end of next week please email me as soon as possible. We would love to have everyone sign up by July 29th, I believe, which is next Wednesday. So take a look at your calendars. Let me know what's, what works best for you. Email me, faith at htelc.com, and I will make sure you get on the list. You can also email me with any questions that you have, and I'll be sure to get those answers to you. 
We're excited to be partnering with Luther Crest, and I think this is going to be an amazing opportunity for my family and hopefully for yours. Thanks. I look forward to talking to you soon. Bye. We'll also have that in tidings and information on our website as well. Thank you very much, Faith. Uh, sitting in the sanctuary, as always, I've noticed more people are using it. Uh, to think, I always, every time I go in, I see more um, X's that are around the sanctuary that people have been utilizing it. So I'm glad for that. Birthdays and anniversaries. Now, all you people with celebrations that are getting ahead of us, go ahead and share. Here we have Bill Murray from Stripes. Happy birthday, gorgeous. May your birthday cake be moist. And Liam Neeson from Taken, I will find you and I will wish you a happy anniversary. Dennis and Joni's Berg anniversary was Friday. Happy anniversary to the parents of Chris Berg. It's been great that you guys have been joining us uh, every week during this time. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on Sundays. I will say Sam's birthday. My son turned 18 yesterday, so that's exciting for us. Scott's father, Richard, turned 86 Robert Moore, a happy 5-0. Well, uh, congratulations, Robert, and happy birthday. And if you saw earlier, Sydney Small turned nine. Jill, Jerry Shock uh, retired from this year after 40 years at the Navy shipyard. Congratulations, Jerry, on that retirement. As those keep coming in, you can keep sharing, but we will have our sending song of Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Drive the gloom of doubt away Giver of immortal gladness Fill us with the light of day All thy words with joy surround me Earth and heaven reflect thy rays Stars and angels sing around me Center of unbroken praise Field and forest, vale and mountain Valley, meadow, flashing sea Chanting bird and flowing fountain Call us to rejoice in thee Thou art giving and forgiving Ever blessing, ever blessed, wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou art Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Back to the birds, birds to bring us home. As worship ends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, birds. And we did forget one birthday we mentioned at the beginning, but Stu Wemple turned 90. Happy birthday, Stu, or uh, is going to turn 90. So that is our worship this morning. If you want to stick around for a fellowship, please do. If you don't, that's okay. Also, once we see our numbers go down, uh, Mark will put us into our fellowship rooms or our breakout rooms for it. Have a great day, everybody. Uh, we hope to see you this week coming uh, at, in some way or another.